Yes, here I am cutting down trees, and I'm supposed to be one of the good guys. But cutting a tree isn't always an ecological crime. In fact, what's going on here is very sound woodland management of both a modern and a very traditional sort. It's called coppicing. This is Blackbeck Woods in the Lake District of Northwest England, one of the few places where traditional coppicing still goes on. It's all in the expert hands of local woodsman Bill Hogarth, who gave me a guided tour. What kind of trees are there here? Well, birch, alder, oak, and hazel mostly. Uh, there's a few other odd ones, a few ash and a few cherry. There seems to be some, some recent cutting there. Yes, I, I started back here yesterday. That's uh, your work? That's, yes, that's... Uh, I was, I've been a force forged and I moved back here to, uh, to start. So do you own this wood or what? No, no, no. I just buy the wood that's standing. What's it cost to buy an acre or something well, like this? Well, it, it varies. Who, it depends who you're buying off. <laughs> I you know, can if, if, if somebody wants it cutting, you can get it for nearly nothing. Or you can pay up to £150 an acre. Mm. Uh, but roughly between £30, £35 to £150 an acre. And even at £150 an acre, you can make a profit? I would only pay 150 pounds an acre if the wood would let me make a profit. You know what I mean? If, if, if it was a good wood. This is hazel, isn't it, Bill? Yes, all hazel. This. Well, I think there's a couple of alder in this uh, in this row. What are you doing with it? Well, I'm dressing it out and sorting them into different things. That that will be for a, a hurdle. A hurdle. A hurdle. That one. Hurdle fencing. This one's a bit thicker. This again will go for a hurdle. So what other things can you do with hazel apart from hurdles? Well, I have 20 outlets for hazel. Hazel's uh, a, a good money maker for you, is it? It is, yes. I look for hazel woods when I'm, uh, when I'm looking around for, for decent woods to buy. That would probably make a besom handle. A besom part. handle, a, a handle bees. of one of those broom things. That's right. Net stakes. What are net stakes? Well, I'll show you what a net stake is in a second when I pick one up. This is a net stake. This again, I would either sell sharpened or unsharpened, and it's a stake for the fisherman, for the inshore fisherman. To stake a, a, a salmon net or something. For putting the nets out. Well, when you go through wood and you're looking at trees and you're looking at coppice tools, do you see? Lots of different products growing there, maybe even on the, off the one stool. That's right, yeah. You have to have an eye, you know, to, to you know what you're looking for. It's early autumn now. Is that a good time for, for doing this? Well, a lot of things you cut with a sap out. Uh, Which would be around now, around October. Now. Hazel. Most of the things that I use hazel for, you need the sap out. Plus the birch leaves are coming off now, so I have to cut the birch with the sap out for the besoms. Bill Hogarth has worked these woods for 40 years, like his father and grandfather before him. He's proud of the tradition, and today turns out over 50 different products, all of them sustainable tree crops. These are some stakes cut out for broad beans. These are net stakes. This is hazel cut out for hurdles. And this is a bundle of what we used to cut out in many years ago, ship for ship's fenders, or setters, as they were called. This is hazel again for spars thatching spars. These are hedging stakes for the farmers, for the, for the hedges. And this is swill wood. What's swill wood? Well, swill wood is the butts of the oak trees, not too large, up to that size, and a little bit bigger, which are made into oak swill baskets. You don't make those baskets No, 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 it's, it's a specialised job. And, and these are bulls. And what are bulls? Well, a bull is the rim of the basket. Oh, I see, yeah. And uh, mostly made out of hazel, but it can be, it can be other varieties of wood. Oak or ash. Well, that bundle here looks like it's just bark. Oh, it is just bark. It's oak bark. And uh, it's one of the main outputs of the... Uh, well, it's, it's the main output of the summer months. And it's for tanning, for high-class leather. Is that a big seller for you? It is a big seller, it is.
I think the younger the bark, the better it is for the tanning. It's a, that's a higher uh, content of tanning in the younger trees. But, uh, you notice this when you're peeling, because um, the younger the tree, they, they seem to be the more sap, the more sap in it. For the three summer months, Bill Hogarth does almost nothing else but peel oak bark. It's the most valuable item he produces. He collects the bark into bundles and leaves it to dry till the autumn, while the peeled oak pulls will go to other craftsmen for making garden chairs and rustic arches. When you think of it, a lot of people rely on you for a living. You see, you supply rustic furniture makers, and without you supplying them, they have no work. I mean, they're, they're, that's, an, that's an entire living for them. Bill, it looks like a perfect existence out here in the woods. It is, yes. I, there's just one problem, and that's the hands. What's that? That's the dye of the oak bark, the tanning. And can't you wash that off? Oh, no, not really. It stays there till about August. It's, uh, I, wash, I wash them regularly, but it, it doesn't come off. Much of Bill's skill is employed preparing raw materials for others to use, but he does make some finished products himself, like traditional besoms from bundles of birch twigs. And what I do, I just get enough to fill this clamp. So that it's not too large for the wire, so the wires won't go around. And then I put the first wire on. And going back, when I first started making these, we used to bind them with cane. But you can use ash or oak strips or hazel. But uh, I've used wires for a long while now. That's the three wires that have gone on. and saw the ends off. Take it out and trim the ends off there. Then get a handle, find the centre of the besom, make sure it's as straight as possible. Bill, I found there's a, there's a knack to using most tools. Does that go for a birch besom too? It does, yes. Show me what to do. Yeah, well, you don't, you don't use it like this. Although no, well, that's what up. I would have done. Yes. You use it like this. Oh, and you get sort of low down. Have a go at that. Yes. <laughs> it's not as easy as it looks. I'm not clearing it as well as you did. No, you're taking too, you're taking too big a, a, sw a swings at it, and you, you're not digging in enough to the... It does a great job when you do it properly. Well, that's not a hazel. No, that's an alder. Growing in this wet spot Growing by the wet. stream. Yes. And the one behind with the whitish bark. The light coloured, yes, that's a birch. Mm. Uh, the top's very useful for, uh, for besoms, but that's too rough for besoms. What about these ones here? This, this is ideal for besoms. The, see the top of it? Oh, it's sort of a bit bushier. Na nice, it makes a nice sweeping broom. And what about the trunk of the tree? Well, the trunk will go for, well, firewood or ch for charcoal wood. Very good for charcoal. There's still uh, plenty of charcoal burners. We've got there. a charcoal burner in this wood. Really? Yes. <laughs> and you're, you're supplying it? I supply it. Straight into the kiln. Walter Lloyd is the man who takes delivery of Bill's coppice wood. Single-handed, he's reinstated the local tradition of charcoal burning based on wood cut from the surrounding area. Bravo, Bill! Bill cuts trees at differing intervals for the various uses. For charcoal, it's usually five to ten years. 
He supplies Walter with four main types, oak, ash, birch, and these orange logs, which are alder. The logs go into the kiln around a central wooden peg ready for firing. No birch at all in this lot? No, all no, alder, Walter. Good. I have a man who wants it just alder, so he'll take every bit I can send him. In former times, this was one of the most valuable activities in these Cumbrian woodlands. Seventy years ago, there were kilns next to every piece of woodland producing thousands of tons of charcoal a year. So I've got the bucket full of fire, and I've got to get it down into the middle of the kiln, down the hole I took the peg out of, because that's where the fire's got to be all through the burn. I thought, Walter, that when they made charcoal, they used these... Uh, I thought you, I was going to see something like a wigwam of branches in the woods. Yes, it's still done in some places, but uh, working single-handed, it wouldn't be economic for me, because you've got to watch it the whole time. If, uh, if ever it breaks through the earth covering, you've got to be there, otherwise you'll lose the whole lot and it'll all burn away. So this is a li little more maintenance-free, is it? Yes. Uh, Higher capital, you've got to buy the kiln. The, the steel drum. So here. much. Yeah. So what you're doing really is you're just setting it on fire. That's right. I'm starting a fire in the middle. Now I want to keep the fire in the middle. It smells then, nice. Oh yeah. And the air inlets down here, these pipes at the bottom, they take the air right into the middle. And that's where the fire's got to stay. And so the heat rises, and when it hits the lid, after I've got the lid on, it spreads out over the lid, comes down the sides, and out through the chimneys that are again at the bottom. Walter, what is it about charcoal burners and snakes? Well, I don't really know, but uh, all the old men said to me, you must have an adder. And the nearest I ever got, when I asked one of them why, he said, I don't really know, he said, but I think it's something religious. So it's a superstition. For luck or something like that? Or something. Have you got one? Not now. I've had one this summer, but uh, I always let them go again in the autumn because they've got to have a chance to fatten up for the winter, you know? They don't bite you. Never bitten me yet. Uh. You never know what you're going to find. <laughs> It'll be just a pile of ash. Now, as I move it, mind your fingers because that edge is dangerous. Okay. Well, I think you've got some charcoal. Good. What do you reckon? It's all right. Yeah, uh, the fire's been a little bit fierce in the middle, but the charcoal will be good. There should be very, very little that hasn't converted into charcoal in that. Walter likes to live close to his work. Some people might say he takes this to extremes. He has a gypsy caravan and stays in it all year round, cooking with charcoal, of course. Do you get a good price for that charcoal? Trade price is about £1.75 for a £5 bag. And uh, in those kilns that I'm using, I can get about 100 bags out at a burn. And I usually do two kilns at a time. And I can burn twice a week without any problems. It's, it's not hard work twice a week. Um, if I want to do more than that, then it gets to be hard work. And uh, after a week or so of that, I can't keep it up. But it means I can produce about um, 400 bags of charcoal a week, which is bringing okay. in a gross of about 700 pounds. And the overheads on that? Well, the immediate costs are the, uh, the wood, which will be uh, about 120 pounds, and the bags about 80. So that you can knock off 200 off that right away, for the immediate costs. And then uh, there are the other overheads, like the... Uh, um, the telephone that I use to take all the orders and the 
motoring expenses, which are appallingly high. Uh, but uh, even so, when you've taken off all the costs, if you are doing charcoal seriously and producing uh, that sort of quantity, you can make a very good living. What about these wooden tent pegs? Don't you have a bit of competition from people making them out of synthetic things? Well, not really. Um, the demand for the cleft pegs that split along the grain like that is... Uh, we, we just can't meet it. There are a few people making tent pegs, but they don't make enough to meet the demand. Who, who's buying them? Well, marquee hirers buy a terrific number. They buy them by the thousand. Um, the army, the war department, buy them by the hundred thousand. And one or two of the big camping firms, uh, sort of a quarter of a million at a time. Uh, so uh, there is a very big demand for things like that. Now how much is that worth? Well, the peg, um, they go for about 25 pence each. Um, to local marquee hirers. And how, much, how many can you and, make in a um, day? Using the, um, um, the stock knife, the big pegger's knife, uh, I can produce getting on for 600 a day. Before cheap plastic and alloy imitations came on the scene, wooden tent pegs used to be made here on a grand scale. It's just one example of a coppice wood product that's found its market again. Traditionally, the coppice made a vast number of different products and so many of them got taken over by plastic and for about 30 or 40 years there was very little happening and the hazel got overgrown um, and hazel, um, hazel coppice that's been cut regularly will live a thousand years um, if you cut it every seven or eight years. As they say around here, if you want wood, you've got to cut wood and uh, by cutting the coppice it would, um, it would grow up again. But if you don't cut it, then it'll die much sooner than, than it would if it had been left alone altogether. And after 40 years, some of the hazel is beginning to die out. Now people want to get back to real things made out of real wood from real trees. And uh, the whole thing about what I'm doing is here is that we're trying to find ways of making the coppice pay again so that we can um, preserve the character of the countryside and have this really rich variety of trees growing here in, in, in any one wood. Hazel's obviously very important to you. What, what makes it so special? What is so special about <coughs> hazel timber that it makes so many things? Well, first of all, it grows very fast on good ground. Uh, you can grow it, the, the stools or, or rootstocks can be quite close together. And so um, when it's ready for cutting, you've got a mass of poles there. And then um, it's very easy to work. It splits beautifully. You can, um, you can split it or cleave it uh, with a bill hook um, or a fro, and um, it almost comes apart in your hand when you do it the right way, down to the size you want. So you can take quite a large uh, hazel rod and split it down to a smaller size. Um, it bends beautifully, and you can bend it, for example, for a hurdle. You're taking it, um, uh, weaving it in and out to the end, and then you twist it round and it comes back again. And if you do your twist right, you, uh, you grip it in, uh, in both hands and you put a twist on it and turn it into a piece of rope and the fibres are separating but not breaking and it goes round the corner without losing any strength. So um, that's one of the advantages of hazel. With all these products and such a ready market, the only thing that puzzled me was why the woods weren't full of people like Bill and Walter. Of course, first of all, a lot of people don't realise that there's this market. Uh, they went out of business, some of the old men went out of business when trade was bad and they got other jobs and they don't realise how things have changed and they haven't come back in. And the young men, I think honestly they'd rather sit on the um, seat of a tractor in a nice air conditioned cab with a, a, a wireless on rather than sit out in the woods um, wearing a leather apron and getting dirty and, and, um, and maybe wet and cold as well. And it's not always no. quite such a nice day as today. No, but it's not all that bad and when you're living out all the time you don't mind the weather as much. You notice it. In fact, you notice it more, but you don't mind it as much. Is the chicken done? Very nearly. Mm. Are you getting hungry? I not mind a bit. It smells, it smells good. good. Yeah. Mm. You'll burn your fingers. You've got a handkerchief. Right. I'll try it. Yeah, grab a bit. Thanks. Mmm. Hot but good. Mmm. Yeah. God, it is hot, isn't it? After spending time with Bill and Walter, I began to get a feel for the right way to run a coppice wood. 
They know exactly what needs doing at each season of the year to keep things healthy and productive. It's a fascinating demonstration of the sustainable management of woodland trees. What have we got here, Bill? Well, this is an older Sewell or Stullion that I cut about six months ago. And uh, covered in all new shoots. Doesn't Great growth. Very healthy looking yes. for six months. Another one over yeah. there doesn't yeah, look well, quite so this, healthy. This one across here, even though it's older, the deer have been browsing all down this side. That's deer damage, is it? Deer damage, yes. And the one in front there, the hazel that I covered to protect it, the, the deer have actually chewed the tops off that. So to manage a woodland properly, you have to understand the whole ecology of it, even things like deer. Oh yes, very much so. In fact, proper woodland management does encourage a vast number of species. It's the, um, the regularly managed wood that is the ideal one for all the wild things, whether we're talking about birds, insects, mammals, um, not to mention man, you know, because we're, we're part of it. And we've been controlling this habitat for such a very long time. In fact, practically all the woodland in this country has been managed. Um, for the last 5,000 years, they were managing it in the Stone Age, and the coppice that we've got now is a result of that management. And uh, if you stop managing it, the whole character is going to change. But well, what happens if you stop managing it? Well, some species uh, get overshadowed as the, uh, the taller trees create a canopy over the lot. And uh, so some species die out. And when the bushes or trees die out, the insects and the birds go with them. And so um, you get fewer species left just up in the canopy. So it gets a little more boring? Oh, very much so. And a little yeah. less productive? Well, you may, if you're lucky, get some good sawmill timber out of it. But yes, less productive, less productive. Do you see yourself as being part of this woodland ecology, living oh, yes. here in the woods? Yes, I'm, I'm sure. There used to be far more people living and working in the woods. There are just a few of us now. And we've managed to um, sort of hold a few things together and keep a few skills going. And, and, and I, in a sense, I see my job as um, combining the best of the old with the best of the new and we're preserving some of the old things that are really important and mixing them into modern life.